Welcome to the House on Fire podcast. Our aim is to light a fire for Jesus in the homes of those who listen through encouragement and equipping. Let's partner together to advance the gospel in the next generation. I am your host, Lucas Jackson, and I am passionate about seeing more people on fire for Jesus. When you listen to the House on Fire podcast, you'll hear from people you can rub shoulders with every week at Bethel Church, because all of our guests are from our church family. These are people striving to love God, love others, and to serve the world. Thanks for joining us on this episode, and really excited to have with us Steve and Des Morton. Guys, thanks so much for joining. Yeah, thanks, thanks for, for having, having us. us. Absolutely. So well, let's start off. Tell us a little bit about yourself and, and your family, and so we can get an idea of who you are. And if somebody runs into you on a on a Sunday morning, like, oh, you're Steve and Des, and oh, I listen to you, and so then they got a little bit of history of you guys. Sure. Yeah, we've been uh, we've been coming to Bethel for three, four years. Four years. Four, four years. Four years. Um, yeah. We go to the ten forty five service. Mm-hmm. Um, we really enjoy uh, Pastor Andy's messages and all the pastors. Really, uh, the music is is great. Um, really, is touches the heart many many Sunday mornings. So yeah. we're glad for that. Yeah, and uh, let's uh, <laughs> tell us about your family. Oh well, uh, we have five children. Um, and 10 grands. Man. And so, yeah, we, we enjoy them and they're not all here in town. Some are, uh, in Colorado and one's in Nashville and a couple are in Minnesota. So, uh, we have some in town and they're involved at Bethel also. So that's, um, it's really nice to have them around and Absolutely. We, we enjoy that. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's awesome. And how long have you guys been married? It'll be 43 years on 43 the 29th years. of May. 43 oh, yeah. we, years yeah. of marital bliss. Yeah, same <laughs> day. Yeah, same day as us, you guys, and is it Sam, Sam and Katie? Sam. Yeah. 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 yeah, I was like, what are the odds? Mm-hmm. The three couples that serve in middle school ministry, and we all three have the same uh, wedding date. Yeah. Crazy. Pretty crazy. Which is kind of nice because it helps me to memorize it. I mean, that one's been easy to remember when <laughs> my kids' birthdays is a little harder. And Wait till you get your grands. Yeah, I think I need a sticky note. <laughs> or, or you have five of them. Try and remember all those birthdays. Oh. Yeah, I remember the first and the last, but <laughs> in between's a little shady. <laughs> yes, sir. Oh, I love it. I love it. And so, where'd you guys meet? Well, we actually met on a church Sunday school church bus for the first time. So you're involved in a church where? I in, in West Fargo. Okay. And then you're and, headed to and, something. And well, no, actually I worked in the bus ministry. Okay. And when I was in high school, and we stopped at his house and picked him and his three siblings up. Okay. For Sunday school. And uh, you know, he was a little kind of whipper dipper there at the time and I was like, eh, you know, nothing. But um, <clears throat> and when you say you worked in the bus ministry, because this was this was a few years ago. This was a long time. Were you driving? the I bus? I was not driving the bus. Okay, because no. my father-in-law, no. he was in the bus ministry. I mean, he's I guess he's almost sixty, and he was driving the bus as a high school student. Oh yeah, which is no, like you no. know, kind of not a thing these days. So I had to no, ask. No. I was like, I can imagine you driving this bus. No, to... my brother actually drove the bus. Okay, he was quite a bit older than well, not five years older than me. Okay. Anyway, so to go on with that story is that uh, I didn't really, you know, think much of it. And he was gone for the summer. He went to work on his uncle's farm. And when he came back, he'd probably grown about four inches and was tan. And, and I'm like, (laughs) Oh, he's kind of (laughs) cute. I love it. I love it. And that's how it kind of started. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Man, how crazy is that? That is, that is awesome. Um, are there, is there like a discipleship group or, or a life group or, you know, it's a group of people that you guys are involved in that you're just pointing each other to Christ on a consistent basis and that kind of stuff? Well, we're, we're involved in, in youth ministry. Um, <clears throat> I have, I'm, I'm a leader of the sixth grade guys on oh, yeah. Wednesday. Yeah. And I show up on Sunday nights to be with the seniors. That's a lot of fun too. Yeah. 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 No, it is, it is awesome to have you guys. It is awesome. Um, when did each of you become believers? So we got to go back a few years and think about the Rolodex of life a little bit. And so, uh, yeah, 
a long time ago um, at Bible Camp, actually, um, Crystal Springs Baptist Youth Camp back in 1968. Okay. Um, I got saved. My counselor led me to the Lord. And um, and how old were you at that time? Nine. Okay. Well, sure, now I'm giving up my age. Well, that's okay. <laughs> it's, only, it's only contingent on they can do math, so, you know. <laughs> Yeah, so I got saved when I was nine and um, was baptized shortly thereafter yeah. um, by our pastor at church. And, you know, I um, I always knew I was going to heaven and I was good with that. And I, you know, I was a pretty decent kid. I didn't get into trouble or anything like that. So I was, um, I just kind of went along with my Christian life. Didn't really probably grow a whole lot. Knew all the stories, knew all the accounts in the Bible about, you know, the great men and of faith. and yeah. Um, very, you know, pretty not knowledgeable, I guess you would say, of those kinds of things. <clears throat> were your parents believers? My parents were believers. Okay. Yep. So I grew up in a Christian home, and um, yeah, I, it, I, I can't say I really grew in the Lord probably until in my forties. Okay. You know, I mean, I always knew I was saved. Like I said, going to heaven, and yeah. was a good. I was a good girl. Yeah. You know, so um, that was. That was kind of my life. I don't really have any major things that happened in my life that made me do one thing or the other. It was just uh, kind of like just going along with the flow. Yeah. Yeah. So that's. Awesome. Steve, what about you, man? Uh, mine is a little different story. Um, when I was younger, we were in a Lutheran church and um, I didn't see a lot of purpose of going to church, actually, especially when they couldn't tell me how I was going to get to heaven. You know, mm -hmm. there just wasn't, wasn't anything there. Uh, we moved to Phoenix when I was 12, um, and there wasn't any Lutheran churches, at least where we were, and so we ended up in a Baptist church. That's quite a wide swing to go from a Lutheran to a Baptist, especially way back then. Yeah. Um, but still not really, I, and I knew there was God, I knew there was something, um, and I was interested, but there was nothing there pulling me to him. Um, it was always more in the dark side of things. I had some friends in school that were actually into witchcraft and, and down that road. I had some that weren't and some that, you know, just high school or, or um, um, sports kids, you know, and so I hung around with them. But these ones that were into witchcraft kind of got my attention a little bit more. And I got a book from them on how to be a witch. Um, brought that home. That did not go over well with my mom. Um, my mom was not overly spiritual, but she knew that was a bad thing. <laughs> yeah. Um, so we got rid of that book. Um, <laughs> that didn't last long. Uh, but but that was just kind of the start of, I know, you know, God was working. God mm -hmm. was working. And I had some really good friends that lived close to me, um, and they were into, uh, into repelling, cliff repelling. Yeah. And so I hooked up with them and, and we did a lot of, a lot of repelling. And I was up one morning, we were out early. We actually had gone out the night before, spent the night in the desert. We were at, um, up close to the mountain of superstitions and, uh, we climbed to the top and we were repelling early. The sun just hadn't quite come up yet. And as I was hanging, I was a little tired. So I went up into the butterfly and started hanging off of that cliff and the sun came around the side and I just knew mm. God was real. And I just knew there was something there. This did not happen by accident. Mm. Um, and so I just, I just prayed. I said, God, if you're real, you got to show me. You got to show me what this is all about because I don't know. Yeah. And uh, so he started revealing things to me here and there. And I don't remember a whole lot about the church that we went to. Um, I don't remember any messages. I don't remember the pastor giving a salvation message. He obviously did. He must have. Yeah. But I don't remember really any of that. But. Um, I had a paper out and I, you know, I kind of like to spend money. So I need to make money. I had a paper out and then I hooked up with some hippies who had a micro van painted all different colors and they had a carpet cleaning business. And this was back in, you know, in the Jesus movement era, yeah. you know, so these guys are definitely, they love the Lord. They did. And they were just crazy. Um, this is awesome. Yeah. And so, and it, and it was, and, and the funny thing is, is it, so he hired me and a couple other guys to put out flowers, uh, f uh flowers. Yeah. Flyers, <laughs> hanging flyers on, on doorknobs. And, and it was a penny, a flyer. You know? And how old are you at this point? I'm 12, 13. Okay. And so, you know, I'm out there just hitting those doorknobs, yeah. putting as many as I could on. Well, I realized these other guys are just throwing them in the garbage can. They're not hanging them, but they're getting the same money I'm getting for hanging them. Yeah. So I go back and I don't remember these guys' names were, but 
uh, kind of like Cheech and Chong. I don't know if you're familiar with them. <laughs> I totally grew up there. watching that. Oh, yeah, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what these guys were like. And so, yeah, I, I, I said, you know, I don't want to get these guys in trouble, but they're just throwing these things in the garbage. And I'm out there. I, she, he said, yeah, I know that. This isn't about carpet cleaning. This is about telling about the Lord, you know. So that was their ministry. And through mm-hmm. that and um, yeah, obviously through the, through the church, the ministry of the church, I got saved. Um, I realized that I needed a savior. I was headed, you know, but you know, like Des, I just basically bought fire insurance. I was getting out of hell. You know, I didn't grow. I didn't really know a whole lot about God. Um, I had a Bible, but I didn't read well. And so King James Bible wasn't an easy thing to read. I read it now and I really enjoy it. Um, but you know, back then uh, it just wasn't, it wasn't really interesting to me as far as reading, actually reading the Bible. And so shortly after that, um, my sister got sick and we, we couldn't live in Phoenix anymore. So we moved back to, to Fargo and actually into West Fargo. <clears throat> and that's where the bus ministry comes in. My dad was not saved, was not religious, did not care to go to church, but he thought we should go. So he, you know, he said, you're going on a bus, you know, he said, threw us on the bus and, and away we went. Um, and then I met Des, and uh, and there was nothing there. I mean, she was cute, but it wasn't anything really until I got back from my uncle's farm. And uh, then we started taking a little more serious, a little more, you know, but I didn't have a driver's license yet. I was still young. So she would pick me up. She had a driver's license. I didn't. I'm 14, you know. And so you, Way so too you, early to be dating. I mean, <laughs> for, but back then that you did. If you didn't date, there was something wrong with you, really. Yeah. I but mean, we didn't really date. I no, mean, pick them up on Saturday yeah, mornings for the yeah. bus ministry and we would go to our- Until I got my <laughs> license, then things changed, you know. Um, but, and then it got a little more, yeah, we, you know, we, we dated more. Uh, we went out. But, you know, one thing, her parents, uh, back then I saw them as being very strict. Mm. Um, but it was good. Yeah. And, you know, her dad was, you know, he's like John Wayne. I mean, he was just this big guy. It looked like him actually. And he commanded your respect. Mm. That's just the way he was. And I, I was so appreciative. Um, more later on, I guess, uh, the stand that they took, yeah. you know, and when we did actually date, I had to have her home at 10 o'clock. Yeah. And uh, it, it just, there was no questions about it. And of course, I didn't really have that. I, I'd moved out of the house when I was 16. My dad and I kind of, I never really got along with my dad. And so I've been on my own already by the time I got my driver's license. And so I drop her off at 10 and then we'd hit all the parties and the thing, you know, I, you know, I smoked, I drank. She had no clue. You no know, but, clue. but, but I look yeah. at it as, I don't know how many of y'all have seen the movie Grease, but that's the way it was for us. I was yeah. Danny. She was Sandy, you know. <laughs> Awesome. She was this goody two shoes and, you know, I was a bad boy. Yeah. And, um, but she was strong. She was, she knew what was wrong and what was right. And I wasn't going to swear, you yeah. know, she didn't smoke. She didn't drink. I didn't take her to those things. Um, but you know, I had a fast car. We raced, we did all those things. I don't think I ever heard her in the car when I was racing. She was on the back of my bike once when I pulled the wheelie through an intersection. Uh, she didn't like that too much either, but, <laughs> but you know, that's just, the way we were. And, um, it, and it wasn't good. It really wasn't. And I think right now we just did a, we just did a series on relationships in, in youth group. Yeah. And, um, you know, one of the things that really struck me was the single, single, um, study yeah. on how to be single. Yeah. And I thought, you know, that I first, I, I realized at that point what happened, where the breakdown was for me, I didn't make good use of my single time. Hmm. I was all about having fun. I was just, you know, running the world. I was saved, but nobody could tell. Nobody knew. Um, and so I didn't make good time, good uh, use of that, that single time when I should have been preparing, um, hmm. you know, and things were, you know, physical between us. We never, we never had sex. We never did that. Um, but way more physical than it should have been. Yeah. Um, and, and we fought a lot. <laughs> um, <laughs> We did, you know, it was like every other week, yeah. are they together or are they not? <laughs> you know, one week we're sitting next to each other in the pew. Next week we're sitting in separate pews, you know, it's just kind of a, kind of a thing we did. Yes, um, what are you but, mad about? I don't know. I'm just mad. <laughs> I don't know what I did, but it must've been something. <laughs> so, funny. Oh, yeah. so yeah, we didn't talk a lot, which is right now. I mean, it's, I, I look at how, 
what we're talking to these young people about and how you need to communicate and how you need to, you know, this, this person that you, you shouldn't just be out there dating just at date. Yeah. You should be looking for somebody that you're going to potentially marry yeah. and, and talk to them and understand who they are. I mean, he went into the military and um, when he got, he was gone for 11 months. Well, he's gone for 11 months before we actually got married. Our wedding date was the 29th and he was coming back on the, what, the 26th or something. I don't remember what the it was. The 27th. Seven. Okay. And yep. I remember when that plane landed and I was at the airport to pick him up and I, I was like, oh my goodness, what am I doing? I don't even know this guy. Well, the invitations are out, so we gotta, we're we going to have to do it, you know? We're and so you've been dating how long? Uh, oh, quite a long time yeah. because, you know, we started, well, actual dating when I was 16. We got married when I was 21. So, okay, you know, okay. We've been yeah. together a long time. So you're, you're like 20 ish. He's landing on this plane. I'm 20, you've, I'm 21. Yeah. And you've kind of sent out, like, hey, you've proposed and you're getting oh, yeah. married. And yeah. I proposed over the phone. You proposed over the phone. <laughs> okay. yeah. yeah. All right. Yeah. I was at, yeah. I was at, yeah. And it wasn't really a proposal. Fort, it was like, Greg. so yeah. Rings yeah. In the mail. You want to marry me? I'm like, oh, sure. Good. The rings are in the mail. <laughs> Honestly, that's yeah, what it was. It was like, <laughs> but you know, if we back that up a little bit, um, <laughs> you know, that, that Danny Sandy grease thing, that was real. It was, but we had a phenomenal pastor at that church, pastor Moser, and he saw something in me. He said, you know, he, he would take me aside and he spent a lot of time with me my whole life. Ever since I can remember, I want to be a cop. I want to be sheriff. Yeah. Um, that was my dream. That's what I wanted to do. That's where I was going. And of course, my lifestyle was not probably lending itself to that career at that time. Um, but, but this pastor, you know, he spent time with me and I, there was something different with him. And at that point, I really felt a calling to go into ministry. Mm. Um, I really did. And, and I love being with young people, even at that point. And I really felt a calling for the youth ministry, um, going to seminary, being a youth pastor. Um, but I got myself in some trouble and um, nothing major, but, and I played football and I love football, but then I got hurt. So I thought, well, why stay in school? I'm not living at home anymore. I got hurt. Can't play football. Why do I need to be in school? You know? So I didn't, yeah. I didn't have a, I wouldn't graduate at that point. So, you know, I was, I was living that rough life and my dad um, didn't have a lot of wisdom for me most times, but he took me aside and he said, you know what, you're going to end up in jail or dead. One mm -hmm. of the two. And uh, he said, I think you need to go in the military kind of straighten out. So I did. We had kind of broke up. We were in one of those <laughs> long haul breakups at that point. Um, and so I said, okay, fine. And, you know, I signed up and I, and I went in. Um, that was a bad move for me. Um, and by that time, the pastor that had been talking to me wasn't there anymore. And so that, that counsel wasn't there. And, you know, I should have, somebody should have said, Hey, you know what, get back to school, get your, get your diploma. And then, you know, then I should have went into seminary or, or down that road of some sort, but I went in the military and ended up loving it. wasn't good for me, but I loved it. It was great. We did all kinds of stuff. You know, I was at the 82nd Airborne, so you know we jumped out of airplanes, we traveled, we were on call. Anytime we were red alert, you know, we were just waiting for that call to go. Yeah. You know, um, Iran was on the radar at one point, um, and and had President Reagan not taken office, and they freed the the um, hostages at that point, we'd have been there mm. and we were in route. So, I mean, that was just, that was great. We got married and I thought that she was on board with all of this military stuff, but she didn't know. She didn't know what it was like. She thought she was on board too. Yeah. I mean, yeah. she, she was pretty excited. The stuff we'd talk about, of course, you know, I still live in that other lifestyle too. I still drank. I smoked. I didn't chase women. I didn't. You know, there was one time I regret that I did something I shouldn't have. But other than that, I was faithful to that. I didn't, I didn't have that desire or that, that just wasn't in my life. But I did a lot of other things that, that I shouldn't have. So we got married. The um, year before I got out, I'm thinking I'm going to re-up. I'm going to cop school at that point, and then I'm going to Hawaii. Uh, that was, that was my plan at that point that was you know being a cop would would come into play later because i'd already be licensed through the military i'd already be a federal cop you know so that would that was back on track however yeah i was homesick like the minute we left the driveway 
Mm. And uh, we lived in North Carolina for 10 months. And we, it, you know, I, I really did think that it was going to be fun. I thought it was going to be great to be away from my parents. Just, uh, you know, we'll have this great married life. We're just going to be, you know, everything's going to be wonderful and uh, roses and, you know, whatever. <laughs> and so, so uh, well, we, we left from my parents' house to drive down. We drove down, took a little trailer with, with a few things that we had. And we stopped at a friend of his that would, had been in the military. We stopped went at for the night at his place. And I was such a brat. Ah, you know, I just did not want to be there. I was irritated with him because he had a friend. And so I went to bed early and he stayed up and talked and he didn't understand that I was upset. And it was, I, so I mean, that's how our marriage started off. It was like, I was, yeah. Anyway, and then, so then we get down to, to North Carolina and when we drive into where we live. He'd gotten a trailer for us in a little trailer court and it was, which was fine. It was hot. It was like 106 degrees. Okay. <laughs> and sand everywhere. And we get in this trailer and it's hot. And he says, you mind if I go visit Larry down the street? Which is another one of his good buddies that lived yeah. in the same trailer court. And I'm like, fine, go. And I'm bawling and he's going down with his buddy. And, and he, you know, again, I was, ugh. so I was, I was, it wasn't really good. It, mm. You know, most people have a great first year. We, we didn't really have a great first year <laughs> or second. Well, you know, <laughs> we had it, was, some, it was, it was tough. It was. And we were in over Christmas that year. And so we came home for Christmas. Um, and then I only had a short period of time. So she stayed and I went back and I thought, Maybe she'll just stay and not come back. And I think she was thinking the same thing. Maybe I'll just stay and not come back. Divorce was never no. an option. It wasn't. No, Even yeah. as tough as it was, it was never something that came into mind because we'd made a commitment before God. We were going to make this work. It may not be fun. We may not have a good time the rest of our life. But, you know, yeah. divorce wasn't it. So, but it was. And I think that feeling... Yeah, yeah, I, I you know. was like, oh, what have I done? What yeah. have I done? I'm nuts, but what now I'm, you know, this is it. We're in it for the long haul. Yeah. And and so, you know, we did have we did have some good times. We did have I mean, some we, good we, times. We had good and times we found between, a church that yep, was, that we found was a really good. good and, yep. you know, you got to play racquetball, so that took a little bit of that heat helped. off of me. Yeah. And, <laughs> uh, but then also I'm seeing now my career is going away. And now what do I do? You know, this is, this was my life. I was going to be there 20 years, 30 years. That was it. And now I'm seeing that fading because this is not her life. Mm. Understandably so. I mean, I get a call and I'd be gone, you know? Yeah. And so, and then and there she was. She didn't really know anybody. We had some church friends, but it's just kind of like, it was, it was a tough life. It maybe wouldn't have been so bad if I wouldn't have been where I was, you know, in the special ops unit, but it, it was hard on, on our marriage, which was not great to begin with. <laughs> so, you know, this just put, a, you know, a really great strain on it. It was really hard. Yeah. And, um, yeah, it was, it was really hard. I was, I was very attached to my parents. My family have always been very close. Yeah. And so it was really hard for me to be away. And, um, and that's all I could think of. I was going home. I, I was going home. I want to go home. I want to go home. My dad had a business. You can work for my dad. You know, it'll be a future for you and blah, 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 blah. Yeah, that well, sounded fun. And that didn't work really well either. So, but, you know, it, it, I, but that's what happened, you know, yeah, and I, and I think there was, there was, you know, he was not real happy with me about that. And I understandably yeah. so. And I didn't understand that. Because why, how can why don't you understand that I want to go home with my family? Don't you want to be around your family? Well, you know, his was not, it was a different family and it wasn't yeah. like ours. And I, my family wasn't saved and you know, I was the only one saved in my family at that time. So I really yeah. didn't have, I with my mom, I was close with my mom. Um, but again, I was out when I was 16, so I didn't have a relationship with my brother yeah. or my sisters at that point. So I had nothing here. I let, I hated the cold. Absolutely. I still hate it. I hated it when I was <laughs> little. My dad used to make me go out and play in the snow. I hated the snow. I hated everything about it. I didn't like sledding, tobogganing, skiing. Uh, skiing, I liked when Des would take me out. We'd ski and that was fun. But I don't like the cold. I was gone. I wasn't coming back. South of the Mason-Dixon line where there is no snow. <laughs> So you're so you're thinking, man, you want to make a career out of this, and then your wife's like, nah, this is. So how long were you in uh, South Carolina, right? North Carolina. North Carolina. Sorry, North Carolina. So you're yeah. there. 
Did kind of all that transpire over a few years or like what? the first no. year? First no, year. First year. Ten, okay. So, 10 months. We okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So you're yeah. there 10 months and then you're life thinking, changed. Yeah. So then wh- like you guys moved back here. We mm-hmm. did. I got out. Okay. Um, and then, and then we moved back and, um, you know, there was a period of time there where I was seriously thinking about getting back in because there, there was a hiring freeze when we came back, you know, I thought, well, I'll go back. I'll be a cop. It'll be fine. So, you know, I went in, I applied with sheriff's department, which is where I wanted to go. I applied with PD. Um, actually, they, they were all froze. They weren't hiring anybody. Um, I went into the marshal service and talked to Marshal Mirror there, and, and he was going to hire me. But then I had to go to, you know, a marshal school, which is in Louisiana, or, you know, um, where the FBI is, Quantico. But, yeah. Yeah. And she wasn't moving. You know, and then there was no guarantee I was coming back to North Dakota. So, you know, it'd still be in that same, that same predicament. Similar to being in the military. Yeah. So the only option I had was go into construction or go in and work in the glass business, which is what I did. And I absolutely hated it. (laughs) I just hated every moment. But here's the deal. One thing, and I'll never forget, and I don't even have the letter anymore. I carried it for years in my vest pocket. But my wife wrote me a letter, and I can't remember all of what it said, but she said, if you want to be a cop, you need to be a cop. But one thing is for certain, if you can't learn to be content where you're at, you'll never be content no matter where you go. I don't know if she really knew the wisdom that she wrote there, but I thought, you know, I carried it because that was so true. Mm. Um, And I worked for a long time trying to be content. Um, and it wasn't just the glass business. There were, you know, it was my father-in-law and two brother-in-laws and me. And the one brother-in-law, we got along pretty good. The other brother-in-law, not so much. And my father-in-law, I loved him. I did. Um, but he was not always so sensitive to the work. Uh, how do you say it? You know, I mean, I made, I made minimum wage, $3 and 65 cents. We bought our first house and we tallied up all the bills. I was $5 short every month. <laughs> You know, and, and it just wasn't, I'm working for my father-in-law. I'm thinking, come on, can't you bump me up a little bit? This, this stinks. You know, yeah. I don't like being poor because I was making pretty decent money in the military. Um, so anyway, you just jump in here whenever. Yeah, no, you're doing just fine. <laughs> so how many years, so you guys moved back, you're about yep. a year into marriage and then figuring out the, the police stuff doesn't work. And so how, so then you hop into working for your father-in-law. How, yeah. how long are you doing that for? Yeah. Um, a lot of years. Um, and there was some time in there where I tried to get into other places. Just, it just didn't work. Um, and it was once, it was kind of like the mafia, you know, you get into the, you get into the business and you're not leaving, you know, you're stuck. Yeah. That's, I mean, it's not the mafia. They didn't <laughs> kill anybody, but yeah, you know, that's the way it kind of felt. You're in the business and you can't leave. Mm-hmm. You're stuck. And, and that's the way it was for a long time. I, we went in there in, uh, I got out in 82 and I didn't leave there until 90 One, 92. 92, 92, 92, so 10 years, Yeah, 10 years I spent there. Um, and, and it just wasn't, and I moved up, you know, I, they put me in management. Um, and, and that was better. I wasn't necessarily out in the cold all the time. Like it was, you know, when I first started. So that got better, but I still didn't like the business and I didn't care for it all that much. So that, you know, yeah, and we still weren't making a lot of money. So and that we still was weren't always, getting along always, real great and we either. Still weren't you know? getting along. <laughs> but in that, you know, in that process, we were already having kids, you know. Mm-hmm. So then we had kids to complicate the matter. I and I wasn't really wanting kids. I I like kids. Yeah. I just didn't want any of my own. You know, I just there wasn't no draw there. I love kids. I love the youth. I love my grandkids. I love my kids, obviously, <laughs> but. Uh, but I didn't really want any, and she wanted kids, and so then that complicated things actually because we weren't getting along all that well. And um, and then we had Livia in '86, and um, uh, yeah, then things started changing, and it started making it more impossible for me to change careers, you know, mm-hmm. because I have to make X amount of money now, you know, and I was already making, I was starting to make decent money in the in the glass company, um, but being a cop was probably out of the picture now because the money wasn't there to be able to support um, a full family without her working. Once we had kids, and she she worked a little bit, but once we had kids, um, you know, I, I made a promise to her as long as I could support the family that she wouldn't work, that she would stay home with the kids. Yeah. And we were already talking homeschool and all of that. And so I'd made that commitment, and I wasn't going to go back on that no matter what. Um, at that point, 
um, I saw, uh, I saw making better money on my own, uh, being a contractor. Um, I, I come from a family of, I'm on my mom's side, fairly handy. My grandpa was a carpenter. My mom did a lot of carpentry stuff. So I had some natural ability. Mm-hmm. Um, and so we got into a remodeling business, which um, it was a good business. It was a good life. Um, I was making better money. Um, and I still did some window installs for, for the window company. I did some commercial window installs, uh, which was better money. And uh, But a lot of it was residential remodels, kitchens, bathrooms, uh, basements. And so, you know, that was good. It was. Yeah. Um, and I, I don't know, you know, we, we started, we we're involved in it. We left uh, one church and got involved starting another church, which hindsight wasn't the best idea, but we were there for a long time in that church. Um, we learned a lot though. We, did. Um, we yeah. learned a lot. It was, it was just a lot of Bible knowledge, just a lot of things about what's going on in the world and mm-hmm. how do you, how does that translate to a to a, a born again believer and how yeah. do we, how should we live in this life and blah, blah, you know, all these things and just a lot of stuff. I mean, we just had, I mean, it a was lot just of prophecy the, the, yeah, the teaching the w- was stuff. really, yeah. really good. Yeah. I mean, it was really, really good, but we were there for, Oh, let's see. That would have been for what, 1988 till 2010. I'm thinking somewhere it was there, a, yeah. somewhere in there. Yeah. And, uh, and, and a point came where God moved us out of there. And moved us to another church. Oh, but there was other stuff that happened while we yeah, were there. Yeah. yeah, so and we were in. I was in leadership. I was a, one of the one of the elders, the teaching elders. When the pastor was gone, you know, I I filled the pulpit, and uh, um, you know, it wasn't real big, so we didn't have a youth group. We didn't have you know full blown Sunday school. We did have some Sunday school, and you know, I taught Sunday school uh, for a while, um, but. You know, money was still, still a little tight and we started to have more kids. We got five total. So, you know, things were, things were a little tight. I thinking that food bill. Oh. The food bill and, you know, and other things, you know, I, I had things I wanted to do and it just wasn't happening. The money wasn't there. And, um, and I was doing some projects and, uh, and I got arrested, uh, for theft of property in uh, uh, the 24th of July, 24th of July 2001. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and here I am, an elder in a church, um, and it, it, it didn't go well uh, for us at that point. Um, things were kind of, you know, at church it was hard. People couldn't understand. I guess I understand totally they wouldn't understand, but... Um, you know, for me, if, um, it was difficult because they were asking questions I couldn't answer. Like, why? Why would you do that? I don't know why. It was stupid. It was dumb. You know, I fell into sin. And, you know, there's a cathedral's quartet. I'm guessing most people don't even know who they are anymore. Great quartet. And they had a song that said, sin will take you further than you want to go. And sin will keep you longer than you want to stay. Mm. And sin will cost you more than you want to pay. And that's what happened. I fell into a sin um, and I took something that I shouldn't have and a few times and, and I got caught. Um, so I was arrested um, and in the process I had two guns in my truck. And so I had not only the theft charge, but I had a uh, concealed weapon. I didn't have a permit at the time. I had before, but I'd let it lapse and I didn't have it. So I had these two guns in my truck. Um, and so initially I was arrested as a class C felony and a misdemeanor gun charge. Uh, the police department, the cops said, no, nah, nope. You know what? There's a gun involved. We got to take this up. With a class C felony, I was looking at five years possibly. Maybe nothing, but up to five years in prison. Yeah. Um, with the gun charge, they brought that, uh, the gun charge is still a misdemeanor, but they brought the felony up to a class B felony, which is a minimum five years in prison with possibility of 10 and a $20,000 fine. So we were having to deal with that. And, um, you know, it, it was, it, it was so very hard on a relationship that wasn't the greatest to begin with. 
And um, I can't even imagine, I still can't imagine what I put Des through. I can, you know, that hurt, that pain. Um, but then we didn't have church support. Um, you know, they, they weren't, they weren't wanting to help. Not, I don't not, think they knew how to help. I, I think. Yeah. No. I, uh, I think, well, for, I, I think a lot of people, well, some of it's my family. I mean, it was my family. Yeah. Um, but my parents were very supportive yep, they and, were. um, they were, you know, but still we never talked about it to anybody. Nobody wanted to really talk about it with us so it was just we were on our own just trying to figure out how are we going to do this how how are we going to survive this how i yeah. mean i have five kids so. and i'm facing prison yeah, yeah. And i mean and my attorney said we're not getting out of prison i mean you're going to do time um there's no way out of this with the police department pushing it they were pushing hard because of the guns yeah um and we weren't getting out of this but yet you know for me, I, and and I think this is what gets to be hard sometimes too, in situations like this. You know, if you're caught in sin, if you're in something that you really, you you know you shouldn't have been there. Yeah. And and just kind of a side note, sometimes you get into stuff you shouldn't be there, but you don't know how to get out. Yeah. Um, I knew how to get out. Quit stealing. You know, I mean that was pretty obvious. I probably wouldn't have gotten caught. But I couldn't, and I was stuck in this, and it was it was stupid. It was sin. It was selfishness. Um, but I, I believe that whole time, I just, Matthew 7, you know, I was asking, seeking, and knocking, and I believe God was going to deliver me. You know, yeah, what what father, when your son asks for bread, he gives him a stone, you know, and I was just, I was just hanging on to that, mm-hmm. and I believe God was going to deliver us. I really did. I thought, what purpose? I was wrong. I, well, and then in part of this, part of the whole thing too, is that I did take some stuff, but there was a whole lot of other stuff that was taken that I didn't take. Mm. Somebody else was helping himself to stuff and I got pinned for it. I, 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 I did it. I'm wrong. I'm not saying that I didn't deserve, um, you know, what I got, but, but I got on the hook for restitution for a way lot more than what, you know, than what I took. Yeah. Um, but anyway, neither here nor there. Um, I just, I believe God was going to deliver us out of that. And, and of course, with the high amount, the dollar amount, um, that just reinforced that felony charge. And um, and I didn't know uh, any, I, you know, I didn't know why God would allow me to go to prison with five kids and a wife um, out on their own at that point. You know, how are they going to survive? How are they going to live? Yeah, I'm assuming Des isn't working at that no. point, and mm-hmm. no. homeschooling the kiddos yep. and all that. Yep, and- yep. And everybody's devastated. You know, I mean, I just told, and I understand. So I heard so many people, so many people with that maneuver, um, and and so I could hardly even ask for forgiveness because I don't know that I would have forgiven me, um, but I knew God had, uh, and I confessed the sin and. And I knew he'd forgiven me. And deep down, I knew we were going to get, somehow we are going to get delivered out of this. Um, and, but we still, you know, we still battled in the church. We stepped going to church. We kept going. I mean, we went to church and sat in the back pew. And <laughs> well, sometimes we sat up, you know, sat up closer. But, you know, it was embarrassing. It was hard. And uh, I'm assuming leadership probably had a conversation with you. Hey, you can't be an elder anymore kind of thing. Uh, yeah, well, I didn't even let him get that far. Mm-hmm. I just resigned, you know, okay. it's kind of like. Yeah. Um, but it was, and and I know it wasn't necessarily true, but it felt like every Sunday there was a message against what I had done. You know, it was like, you know, here we go again, you know, <laughs> do not steal, <laughs> you know, it, it wasn't in all honesty, it wasn't, but I did irritate the leadership mm-hmm. and there was some, there was some hard feelings there. And there's some people that have not forgiven me yet for what I had done. And of course it's past It's 20 years ago. So it's not like they're harboring these hard feelings. They still will greet me when I see him, but, but I never, they never really forgave me for what I did. Um, and so, you know, that was hard, but here's the thing, you know, when you're in sin like that, like I was, I confessed it to God. I was healed with God. He was okay. Now there's still consequences. Don't get wrong. Yeah. You know, you do something, especially that severe, you're going to pay a price. You are. Um, and, and with really any sin, if you're in sin, if you stay in sin, if you're committing it, con- you know, continually, which 
obviously if you're a believer, that's not a route you should be going. Yeah. Um, uh, but you know, I got trapped in it. So, um, but for me, I, I was forgiven from God. Um, and I knew that, and I knew there was going to be a price to pay. I was looking at prison time and now I wanted everybody to forgive me. You know, I thought, okay, I'm forgiven. Now let's go on with life. Help me out. Let's go. And, you know, even my wife, I was thinking, okay, how long can this be before you forgive me? Well, it wasn't that I didn't forgive him. I, right. I did forgive him and yeah. I loved him and I wanted him back. Yeah, and but I, it was a trust thing at that point. It was a it trust was, thing. And I wanted yeah. him to acknowledge the fact that, that he had things to work on. Mm. I, I wanted him to talk to me more, you know, to talk to me about stuff. I knew he was still dealing with stuff. There was still stuff. It was, you know, that doesn't just, I mean, yeah, he, he's not going to steal anymore, but he's still got to deal with all this money, got to pay back all this and that, you know, and there's other things going on and, and we still couldn't communicate. I mean, we just did not, I would try and talk to him and he didn't really, he was not, never a talker. He's never really been, um, you know, the great communicator. <laughs> he's doing fine. Really good today. Hon. <laughs> <laughs> just put a mic in front yeah. of me. Yeah. yeah. Just crushing it. Um, you know, but it so, was embarrassing. so it was you know? hard. It was so hard because I, I wanted to trust him, but how could I trust him? Mm-hmm. How could I, how was I going to get past this? How was I ever going to trust him again? You know, and how do you tell your kids? How do you talk to your kids about this stuff? And, you know, it was, it was, and plus, we, and like I said, we didn't, I didn't have anybody to talk to. I mean, there was really nobody that I felt that I or that would wanted to hear about anything that we were going through. And so that was really hard, but, but that was really good, you know, because it drove me to God's word. Mm. And I tell you, I, I went through the Psalms. Oh my goodness. I would be in the Psalms because David was always, Lord, (laughs) I need your help. (laughs) You know, I need your help. Please deliver it. Deliver me from this. You know, why? Why? I mean, he asked God why, and and I was asking God why, and what do you what do you want from me, and how you know how are we going to do this? And I would sit in the bathroom and I just cry because it was just hard, and but it just kept drawing me back, drawing me back to God's word, and that was what got me through, honestly, because um, I that's all I had. Yeah, you yeah. know. Yep. Well, how, how long did you know from the moment? you know, you were caught or whatever, how long did it take until sentencing actually happened and how, how long did you get? Well, it, it happened fairly quickly. You know, that happened in, in July and I went to court on, uh, October 31st, Halloween day of that year, 2001, fully expecting that I probably wasn't going back home. Um, and the state's attorney, for whatever reason, I, I obviously God moved. Um, when I got up to hear the sentencing, um, they had reduced, they'd taken off the gun charges and reduced my felony to a C. And the judge was kind of at a, you know, he was thinking, what's going on? Um, then she said he has never been in trouble. He's had some minor traffic violations. We have no reason to believe that he's going to recommit, and we are going to suggest that we do a deferred imposition. In other words, I plead guilty to the felony charge, and then I fulfill a certain amount of things that they laid down for me to do, it was community service and restitution. Um, and then at, and probation. And at the end of that time, I fulfill that and it'll get in trouble. Then my, um, record would be expunged. In other words, it's still there. The FBI sees it, but if you pull a background check, you're not going to see it because it's gone. Yeah. So I've got three years probation. I got 200 hours of community service and restitution. So, um, my solution to many things has always been work hard, you know, just work at it, get it done, get after it. 
And so that's what I did with this. I had my community service fulfilled within months. I was I went up to the hockey arena up on the north side. When I first got there, they had me cleaning toilets and scraping gum from underneath the chairs. By the time I was finishing up, they had me running the Zamboni and and I was in charge of the other guys up there, the other felons. So, you know, I was kinda like kinda like um you know, Joseph in a way, I was in I got ended up in kind of a prison type thing, but then yeah. I it was doing a good job for him, so they promoted me up, if we call it a promotion. Yeah. But so I got, you know, I got that all done. I got my restitution paid. I did have some help from my brother in law. Um and so he helped us get things paid off and paid down and, and we paid him back. Um, but to get things off the books. Yeah. Uh, my parole officer was, he was a phenomenal guy. I mean, he, you know, I, I don't know if any of you ever been on parole, but you know, they can come in wherever you are and check up on you. So if you're in the middle of a job, if you're on, on the job, in a job, in church, wherever, they yeah. can just show up. And it's pretty obvious that, you know, that they're a parole officer. But um, you know, we got along really well. Um, and, and so he saw that there was something different. And during this time there was, my heart had changed. I realized that, you know, this was bad and I need to get serious with God. And, um, you know, I repented of my sin at that point. And, you know, I think we don't understand what repent is anymore. I think you don't, you say, I'm sorry. And that's repent and you walk away. Well, you know what? That's not repent. And we had a fellow that was at one of the seminars we had, and I can't remember his name, but he was a, he was, um, a Jewish fellow. And the Jewish definition of repent is to burn the house and salt the land. In other words, you got nothing to go back to. You do a 180 and you stay on that 180 path because you got nothing to go back to. That's what yeah. repent is. And that's what I did. Now it wasn't, it wasn't uh, perfect by any means, but, uh, you know, my life still, I still had some problems. Um, but I got, I got done with, with all I needed to get done. They left me off probation. Um, after a year and a half, the judge said, okay, you're doing well. We're going to take you off probation. You're no longer under probation. I then filed to have my rights. When you're a felon, you lose your rights, gun yeah. rights, you lose all that. Voting rights. Yeah. yeah. And so I filed with the judge to get my rights back. And being that my, my, uh, sentence had been expunged in other words taken out it was a lot easier to get those rights back yeah so i still you know i can now carry a gun i can vote i do all that stuff it's been 20 years out now um so i got all that back we're doing really you know things are starting to shape up i i think we are a lot closer we're praying together you know we're we're talking more um and so our, our marriage has begun to heal and started getting stronger <laughs> And I'm on the job one day and I'm um, up on a second floor deck getting off on the ladder and the ladder kicks out and I fell. Dislocated my shoulder, busted up my head. I had 13 stitches over my right eye. I think I had a, I had a concussion at that point. So I'm pretty messed up. Um, they set my shoulder and I'm in a lot of pain. And um, so they gave me some uh, painkillers. And I started taking painkillers and I started taking painkillers and I took mere painkillers and pretty soon I started chasing it with booze and I got hooked. Um, and those were again, hard years. Um, and I denied it, you know, people would ask and I'd deny it. And really the only one I was fooling was me because everybody else knew I was on something, doing something. Yeah. Um, you know, I found a doctor in town that would give me the drugs. And uh, so it was prescription drugs I didn't have prescription for, but um, it wasn't that I was doing Coke or, you know, heroin or any of the hard drugs. Um, but I, it was two years that I was messed up and I have days I don't remember. I was out there driving. I was out there working, and and I don't remember coming home. Um, and and I think, wow, God is so merciful, so gracious that delivered me. I didn't kill anybody out there while I was driving. I didn't even get picked yeah. up, you know. And He allowed that. And and you, you think, why God? Why did you allow that to take place that way? And I still don't really know, um, why He allowed me to go through that and not get into more trouble. Um, but I remember one day, it was a Monday morning. I don't remember the date. 
I just remember getting up and I just, I, I, I was sick and tired of being sick and tired. I just had had enough. And I think God was just putting me to that point. Mm. And for me, I'm all in, no matter what it is, good or bad, I do it to the hilt. <laughs> and, uh, and I was doing this yeah. to the hilt, you know, and I think I got to the point, God has to take me down, just like getting arrested for theft. He had to take me all the way down to bring me back up. And that's the way this was. And I got up that morning and you know what? The pills went down the garbage disposal. I dumped the bottle of booze and I went cold turkey. And those were a couple of hard weeks. I had the shakes and the sweats and the, you know, I didn't go in for rehab. I didn't go in for, I'm not saying rehab is bad. I and mean, there's people that need that. I get it. Yeah. But I just trusted on God. I God, okay, once again, here I am. Take care of me. Take care of this because this is bad. I need out. I need out. And, um, and he delivered me from that. Um, what are you thinking is, I mean, how old are your kids at this point? Are they high school, middle school? Uh, adults? Our, our oldest was, was 14, 15 at the time. Okay. Um, and it, Josiah, the, the baby, he was one, two. You know, okay. so the, we were just talking about that this morning and the three older ones knew there was something going on. Um, and they knew about what had happened and, you know, we talked to them about all that and stuff and, and the, and the whole, the church and all that. And there was just, it was hard for them because they felt like they were being hard on us. You know, the church was being hard on us. And so they were not real happy with that whole part of it. And still have some, you know, issues with that a little bit. But, you know, we've talked to him about that too. But, um, yeah, so, yeah, because, I, I mean, even like he said, when he was drinking and on drugs, he didn't think anybody knew. I knew there was something. I Because his gla eyes were glassy. I mean, he would do, you know, he'd be really in a good mood and all of a sudden he'd be just, you know, mm -hmm. mad about something or whatever. And so I knew there was something going on. And, um, but I didn't know what to do, you know, I what do you do? I, you could ask yeah. him, no, I'm, you know, I'm not doing whatever, whatever, you know, you, and so it was really like, Lord, again, you know, help. You have to, you have to do this because there's nothing I can do. I, I just don't know what to do. So there I am again, you know, I'm just spending time in God's word and praying and just trusting that God's going to, God's going to work it out. And he has, I mean, he has been so gracious in our lives. I, I don't know how people go through these kinds of things without a relationship with Christ. I, I absolutely do not. I, yeah. Without him, we couldn't have, we, it would have been, I probably would have left him and divorced him and he would have probably committed suicide. Who knows? I mean, it would have it, it just, because yeah. it was just hopeless. It was just so hopeless. I mean, then, yeah, from going from the whole theft thing and then now we're dealing with the drugs and the alcohol and, and, um, but again. And suicide just, wasn't off the table for me at that point. You know, there were a couple of times when, when I'm sorry, I interrupted. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, you know, I, I just couldn't face it anymore. And, and I thought, you know, this is it. I, I can't do this. And yet God really convicted me of that thought that suicide is not an option. There is always a way out. God will provide a way out. If you want to be healed, if you want to be set, not that there's not consequences, there is, yeah. but God can deliver you from all of that. And I was to the point so much as that I looked at my life insurance policy to see if there was a suicide clause to see if my family would be taken care of. And guess what? There's a suicide clause. Um, but that happened twice to me. The first time I didn't check the, the insurance policy and I just thought, no, this is crazy. I can't leave my kids. I can't leave my wife to deal with this because this wasn't going to go away. Now they have to deal with it. And now I'm dead, you know, and then I have to yeah. try and answer for that. And this is, this is dumb. Yeah. Um, but I think, and, and I'm not making light of the suicide thing, but I think one thing in our society now is it's so accepted. Um, we don't want to deal with the problem. We want to take an easy way out, but you know what? If you're not saved, that's not an easy way out. And if you are saved, I don't think, still don't think it's an easy way out. You could stand before God. Um, yeah. uh, but to me, that is definitely not an option. I've seen God deliver us out of so much. Um, and it's not easy, you know, through all of that, I will never retire because I don't have any money. You know, we paid a lot of money back. We paid a lot of things. Not that there was, um, that I didn't deserve that. I did, you know, I deserved it to, to go through that. Um, but I'm going to be working 
you know, I won't have that retirement that many people are going to enjoy. But, you know, the thing is, through all of this, you know, we were set free from that. And again, the church, they knew about it. Um, I confessed it. We went through that. And right towards the very end, before we left, I think there was some forgiveness there. I think um, I actually was back in the pulpit again for a short period of time at that church before we left. Um, but, you know, through all of that, when we came to the end of that, I, I, just, I had this burden, and it's been a burden for 20 years because it's never been really recognized. God's not really ever opened up a door for that ministry. But I really feel that people need to understand that if you're caught up in sin, there's a way out. And I really believe that there are more people that are caught up in hidden sin and are not not admitting it. Yeah. They're not dealing with it. I mean, there's alcoholism, there's drugs, there's porn is huge. Cheating, stealing, um, you know, extramarital, uh, extramarital, marital sex. I mean, all that stuff. Um, and they keep it hidden and they keep it hidden. And, um, and I just really, uh, you know, I just went before God and said, if you can use my story, if you can use our life to help someone, to help some people get rid of that bondage, that uh, sin in their life, please do. And, um, you know, it's never really, I mean, we've had people we've talked to, but it's never been a big ministry. Where we've been able to talk to people and help them. Because, and it's been a desire of both of ours. I mean, she had a lot of healing and she doesn't necessarily always get a chance to talk about her side because I was the bad guy, you know, but she has a lot to offer women who are going through that um, to help um, put up with what's going on, to help with forgiving and trusting. And, um, uh, you know, ultimately it's God that's healing and doing the healing, but it's through his word and through people. And, you know, we didn't have that. And I think that's so important. And I didn't realize, um, how important it really is to have someone to be able to talk to, to have someone help you through, you know, we made it through. We did praise God. I mean, and that's all you need is God, but it probably could have been quicker and easier had we had someone to lead us through hmm. um, all of this, to help us get to the other side um, and to, to recognize that freedom. But you know, one thing, and I, um, I, I, I've been, I've been dry. I've been clean for 20 years, but I did a lot of work for, a, for a uh, architect in town. I remodeled his whole house. I, I was building a bar for him. Um, and so just finishing up, I was nailing in some bottom trim and I'm looking up and there's a bottle of whiskey. I mean, there was booze all over in that house, but I look up and there's a bottle of whiskey and I, I had never had any trouble with it. Uh, you know, with that temptation and look at that bottle. And I thought, you know, I could take a shot and nobody would ever know. Nobody'd ever know. And it was a temptation that I had never experienced. And it was directly from the demons of hell trying to get me to go back into it. I had to call my wife right away. I said, you know what? This is the deal. I'm sitting here on the floor. There's a bottle of whiskey in front of me, and I just got tempted to take a drink. And I want you to know I didn't do it. Mm. I didn't take it. You know, we have to be accountable to someone. Um, and for me, and it's easier now. I'm not saying it's never going to be a temptation. Uh, but to, to the drugs, definitely not. I have no desire for that, but the booze, I think, you know, I could at times maybe fall back into that. If I allowed myself, uh, my brother-in-law and I went down to Tennessee on our bikes this summer. He drinks. I don't temptations there, but he would never have let me, he knows my stand and he would never have let me take a drink, you know? So even though he's not a believer and he drinks, he still understands my conviction um, but you know, Romans 6, 6, uh, about the old, talking about the old man, haven't put that old man to death. And I do it every day. Mm. I do it every day. It isn't drinking, but sometimes it's an attitude. Sometimes it's, um, trusting. Um, but I have to put that old man to death every day. It's a battle every day to walk the straight and narrow. Um, and I think once we realize that those temptations are out there, um, those things that you struggle with are out there. Um, you need to learn to how to stay away from it, but you also need to learn to trust in God to put that old man to death. Amen. <laughs> well, man, there's so many questions I want to ask. Um, Go ahead. Was, I got two sheets of answers here. I, I know. I and we're we're on, we're on the we question even, three. So we haven't. <laughs> I just, this has been great. It's, well, and these were just you know made up questions to help guide our time and. 
and you know and um how did how did all this affect your relationship with each other i mean you you obviously talked about the trust factor and all of that which totally makes sense the difficulty there and so how has this changed or affected your relationship with each other and even your relationship with your kids uh with with each other i got to say that took a long time to change things yeah. um and like I had mentioned earlier before, he, he's not, he's not really a talker and I am a talker. Mm. So if something comes up, I want to talk it out. And he's like, there's nothing more to talk about. And so that's kind of the way it was. There was nothing to talk about for him, but there was for me. I want to, I want to talk and I want to know and I want to, you know, and so that, that has been, and I think, in, I think in spite of even all of the other stuff that went down with him, that was an issue we've always had in our marriage from the beginning was that I was always a talker. He was not. And, um, they always say, Oh, you know, um, opposites attract mm. and opposites do attract. Um, but I would suggest don't marry your opposite. <laughs> um, marry someone who is like-minded with you, who wants to talk about things with you, who wants to, you know, that you can, yeah. I, I mean, we enjoyed doing stuff together. Like, you know, we'd play flag foot. We were in the youth group and stuff and we loved doing that kind of stuff together, play flag football and, you know, go out to eat and go to movies and that kind of stuff, but we didn't talk. Yeah. And so that kind of, tra- it, it just made its way through our, our marriage. And so when this all came up, it didn't change that, mm-hmm. um, for a while it took time. And I, and there were days I really didn't like him at all. Yeah. Um, there are days I didn't like me and, you know, and I, and I know that was, and I, well, and that was one of my prayers too, is like, Lord, I know I can't be like this. I need to be different. I need to be Mm -hmm. Christ to him. I need to love him. I need to be supportive. I need to be, I know, but I don't want to, (laughs) you know, he's a jerk, you know, look at that, you know, and, and that was really hard for me. Um, because I, I, I wanted, you know, I wanted things to be a certain way and they weren't that way. And now they were never going to be, we were never going to have this. We were never going to be able to do this. We were going to be in bondage for the rest of our lives. And, and he didn't really want to talk about it. And and when, even like with the whole alcohol thing and he started smoking at a point too. And I, I confronted him one time. Oh no, that wasn't his. I mean, it was all, you know, he still would not, it wasn't, you know, it took a long time. So I would say by the time, like you said, by the time we left, the first church that we are the second church that we had, where we were at by the time that we left there, um, God had done some major changes in our marriage and it was hard for our kids because we talked to them about it. But, um, at the time we were in this church, which was, like I said, a lot of good teaching, a lot of solid, solid teaching, but not a lot of grace hmm. was a, you know, very and, legalistic. And, um, so they had, they struggled with that. So when we went to the the next church, I remember the first Sunday we were there, they sang wonderful, merciful savior. And we both stood there and just cried because it was, that's what God was to us. Mm. I mean, he was merciful and gracious through all of what we went through. And, um, we learned grace at that church, which we hadn't really learned which is is sad um but that you know through through that and going to this other church and we were spending more time in the word and spending time with good christian friends and 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 then we got involved in the youth group there um and we loved that loved it absolutely loved it um we really do have a heart for young people and um God was gracious. We never thought we would ever have an opportunity to do anything mm. like that. Mm. And so that was a real blessing for us. And, um, yeah, just a real a good time of growth for both of us, too, and teaching and just being able to just being able to enjoy the grace of God. Yeah. Yeah, it was, it was good. It was good times. Um, I don't know. That answered your question. No, no, that's great. No, that's great. Well, I again, the Rolodex in my mind <laughs> yeah. of all the questions I want to ask. Uh, well, one thing that comes to my mind is why you're believers, you're seeking the Lord, there's still sin, and you're you're recognizing that, 
repenting of that, turning from that, you know, which is praise God and and um, but I, but I often think, wh- why in the world are you still a part of a church? Because it's things like like this that easily where I think people are like, yep, see, this is why I'm, you know, the church is flawed, which it is, and sinful because it's made up of sinful people. And <clears throat> so to go through all that, why why still be involved? Why committed to a church still? Because we knew that's what God's called us to do. I mean, ultimately, that's been the call he's placed on our lives is to bring honor and glory to him. And, you know, we failed, you know, miserably. And yet he was gracious and merciful. We owe him, mm-hmm. you know, we owe, we owe him. And he just gave us that, he gave us a desire for the young people. And I mean, and then he opened the doors for that. It was just, we just did it because we loved it. And we were just so thankful that we could, Yeah, you know, and that's why we just, I mean, we've just, we've, yeah, we've never really missed church. I mean, I, I, mm-hmm. I got to say, through all of that, um, we might have missed a couple Sundays, but for the most part, we we because we knew we knew that's where we belong. We stayed at the other church until God moved us. Yeah, um, and there were some other things involved um, that you know, we're just not going to get into. But um, you know, we were there until we were at a point where God <clears throat> very obviously told us, "You need to leave and go to another church," and then. That was hard, finding another church, you know, and yet uh, when we did go to this other church, we were invited, invited there um, from some other people that we'd attended church with uh, previously. And uh, and we went and it was just like, just this flood of, I can't even explain, it's like the Holy Spirit was just moving. It was phenomenal. And um, you know, and it wasn't a perfect church. They were in the process of changing pastors or calling a pastor, and yet the love that was there, some of them knew our past, and majority of them didn't, um, but some of them did. And I will never forget the one man that I thought, this is one of the ones I thought never forgave me. Um, he was an usher that morning, and as he came by with the offering plate, he shook my hand under the plate said thanks for coming and it was just such a such a blessing being there um it was phenomenal and then you know i got involved in leadership which i wish i wouldn't have um i'm done with leadership (laughs) i I mean it's a necessary thing but i don't want to be a part of it and i'm good at it but i don't want to be a part of that i don't want to be an elder deacon i don't want to do that anymore it's too messy and um and yet, through all of that, we ended up being youth leaders, um, and and we had, I don't know, when everybody was there, 25, 30 kids, I, and it was just, it was great. I mean, we went to retreats, we went to uh, camp, Camp. Um, it was just phenomenal. Those kids were great, and we just loved it. And, you know, some things fell apart for us, not anything that we had control over. There was just some jealousy issues there with the pastor that was there at that point. Um, and he didn't like the fact that the kids liked us. And, you know, there were just some things there and I don't mean to bad mouth him. He's got to stand before the Lord um, with, with the things that he's dealing with. Mm. Um, but, you know, he pretty much showed us the door and, um, and that hurt mm. uh, because I was all in. You know, it's all I wanted to do really since I was younger was to be a youth pastor and to be involved with the youth. And so when that door closed, I'm 60 years old at that point. I'm thinking this is over. You know, I'm not going to get in anywhere anymore. I'm not going to be able to teach or to be a part of. And it was to the point where actually I gave away all my Bibles. I gave away all my <laughs> teaching stuff to my kids, you know. And and I have one Bible that I always use and it print's pretty small and it's getting pretty worn it's old <laughs> um but it's got all my notes everything and i was breaking in some new bibles as i was teaching and so you know my kids got some of my notes and of course my old bible will go to my son when i pass but um but i'd, I'd given everything away because i just figured that time is over not that I was over with God, because I've never, through all of this, all of this, I never once was angry with God 
Why are you letting this happen? Why are you doing this to me? It was never. It was always, God, forgive me. God, help me. God, what am I going to do now? And 60 years old, God, I really thought we were had arrived to where you were calling us, and now you've shut that door. Why? I think sometimes we, um, we are the uh, consequences to other people's sin at times. Mm, yeah. Um, you know, so uh, we'll just leave that at that. And then, I, yeah. I, you're saying uh, we never, we never question. I mean, we did well, we, I shouldn't say we didn't question. I questioned God. I was like, why? I never got angry, but more frustrated with people, mm. you know, people. What is the matter with people? What, why? You know, I, that was hard, really hard. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, when we left there, it was like, yeah, great. Now where are we going to go? And uh, we checked out. We went to a few places, never really found any place we were comfortable. We came to Bethel because our kids were here. Um, two of them were helping with Awana at the time. Not and yet. Not yet. They yep. were, they were just coming. Oh, they were they just, just going. Oh, and then we that's started right. coming. Yeah, we started, right, we went, right. we went one time and got blown out of my chair we with the music out. and said, this ain't happening. We walked, we walked we're out. out of here. We walked out. It was yeah. like, oh, forget it. We're never yeah. going back there again. That's yeah, that was crazy. Pastor Nate and the worship team. <laughs> they just, boom. Whoa. <laughs> I mean, we're going, coming from singing hymns every Sunday, with which or- nothing with wrong an, with it. With an organ and a piano only, you know. And all of a sudden we get blasted. Like, whoa. Crazy. Yeah. So, but yeah. So it was. It's not bit. that we don't like contemporary music. You know, we do. We listen yeah, to it. You know, I mean, it just, we just where weren't. We stood in it church. was just a little loud that Sunday, and yeah. it was a little much for our our ten, our tender ears. Yeah. yeah. But but it's kind of funny because now we do fine. But um, yeah. So yeah, we kind so we kind of looked for looked around again. You know, checked up. There just wasn't any place that was calling us. I mean, just yeah. it just wasn't. Uh, there was nothing that we really felt that God was leading us to. And um, so the girls just were like, you need to come back, you know? So we did, we came back, but we, you know, we were here. Let's just, you know, we were here. That's all we were. We were here on a Sunday and sometimes reluctantly, you know, we became all about four years, I think. Right. It was it about four years. Yeah. And then Lucas showed up. Yeah. <laughs> Found us sitting in the back row. <laughs> I, I remember how that went. I, let's see. Allison took you guys to lunch. Yeah. <clears throat> and she's like, oh, I met with this couple for lunch, and they are clearly passionate about students, so not kids. <laughs> so you, you need to meet up with them. So um, Yeah, and then you just, you know, you didn't give up. And we're like, what is with this guy? Gee, he's just not giving up. He's not giving up. Uh, well, maybe there's something to it, you know? I have been a little persistent in a few things in my day. Um, well, we needed that. We did. We needed that. We needed somebody to say, Hey, you know, just check it out. Just come check it out and see what you think. And, and, uh, y- you know, it, nobody had ever done that with us. Usually anything we've ever done, we've had to push for it. <laughs> you know, we've had to, it's been us wanting to do it or whatever and saying, Hey, we want to do this. We want to do this. We want to do this. Yeah. We never, never had anybody who really pursued us to be involved in a ministry like this. And, um, you know, we haven't looked back. We love it. Well, it's been great having you guys on the team. I, yeah, I love having you guys and it's a joy to see. And I, um, there, there's components where, I mean, I love having, I mean, I don't really feel like you guys are old, but <laughs> you know, uh, I'd love having multi-generational, you know, uh, college and high school involved, you know, middle school ministry or whatever, or, and just, uh, I love it. When we have people of many generations around living on our students and, and I like it when there's people around who don't necessarily fit into the typical churchy mold. <laughs> uh, and who are you talking about? <laughs> and, what are you saying? And I feel comfortable to say that because we've talked, well, you've, at least you've brought it up at least a couple of times to me. So I just, and I, yeah, I, there is a component that I often think in church world and, and God's gracious. And, and I think oftentimes there's not malicious intent. Um, but you know, we don't always get it right. And, and we have to ask for forgiveness and repent of that. And there's repercussions, you know, of, of sinful decisions, you know, even pastors and elders make. And, um, and we, yeah, we get it wrong more than, 
we'd like to admit. And um, But to be honest with you, I mean, I never thought we would do anything again mm-hmm. with the youth. Um, we, and, and honestly, I'm like, nobody's ever going to want. <laughs> For those who aren't in the room, <laughs> Des is pointing at her husband. <laughs> He's not the traditional church going boy that he was when I, you know, met him and married him. And for the, how many years of our marriage, um, yeah. He wore he wore a suit and a tie and had nice short hair and you know I've seen that picture yes actually and yeah, I yeah and I and now he has different. he doesn't look like that anymore and I'm thinking good grief people are gonna think we're so weird nobody's <laughs> gonna want us they're gonna nobody's nobody in the church is gonna want us to do anything with their kids they're gonna think oh my goodness he's a hoodlum or something you know motorcycle gang banger. <laughs> I don't find any humor in that. I, I find it tremendous. If you want to find us, we sit on the left-hand side towards the end on the 1045 service. I have long hair and a beard, and we're gray-haired. And I have short hair, so people look in front of us behind, and they think he's the gal, and I'm the guy. <laughs> I never thought about that. I, I've not, I don't think, sat behind you guys in church before, so that is funny. Well, I can only imagine what it looks like. I, I haven't sat myself behind myself either. So, But anyway, yeah. Well, I'm so, a little bigger than most women. Well, that's true. But <laughs> but anyway, God has a sense of humor. Yeah. He really does. And he said, you think you're not done? You think you're done? You're not done. Yeah. Um, I got something for you. Yeah. And so. And, and it's been good. You know, I always want to be a youth pastor, but you're the youth pastor and I get to minister. You know, you got to deal with all the stuff and I get to be with the kids. Yeah. You know, and what a blessing. I'm not saying yeah. that in a bad way. Yeah, it, just you know, I, I get to do what I love doing, and I don't have to deal with the paperwork. You know, yes, sir. Uh, there's a, a little bit of paperwork to <laughs> deal with. Uh, yeah, I and and it, there's pros and cons to all that, and I'm just grateful for my time, even you know, with the students and trying absolutely. To and we're grateful for you. Yeah. It's been it's been phenomenal getting to know you and be a part of your yeah. ministry. We're, we're very happy with with what's going on. Um, you know, even with the recent, uh, I, I'll be honest with you, you start talking about, you know, sex and all that, you want to do a course study on that, I thought that guy's crazy. <laughs> I don't even know how to answer some of that stuff, you know. I mean, how do you do that? But you've done a very good job, and uh, it's been easy to follow your lead, and we're thankful for that. The kids needed to hear everything that we've been talking about. So it's been great. That's been a good thing. Yeah, it has been it has been fun. We've... <clears throat> You know, I feel like we've, I personally have addressed, addressed it a little bit more differently than I have in the past. But, and for those listening, we um, did the last four to six weeks here. Um, I guess we're just into March now, I guess. Um, so most of April and a little bit of March, we did a, um, we talked about marriage, singleness, dating, sexuality, kind of covered all the, said all the words that most people don't like to talk yeah. about. And yeah, and relationships and was good. And, and uh, I'm, been encouraged by yeah some of the, many of the responses from students and even got a couple of students I'm meeting with who are trying to uh, overcome porn and all those things and so excited about helping them fight mm-hmm. against that and all that and it's been good and and in many ways I think your guys' story is a testimony to the fact that uh, I know a lot of people who and I, don't, I guess I don't have specific person in my mind as I say this, but I know there's a lot of people who come to church, you know, they get there on time or late or leave early or whatever. And that's kind of what they do. And there's many, I think I've heard the phrase, well, where people to often talk about in past tense, oh, I used to do that. Or I used to do that. Or, you know, I'm like, what are you doing now? Well, I, you know, and I'm, and the, and so I think just your guys' story is a testimony to the fact that, um, you're still getting after it, and there's many, many people in the context of the church that that don't ever really get after it. Um, and God's gracious, of course, and merciful, and you know, and and they, uh, for good or bad, they're missing out on the blessings, you know, of, of what comes with being a part of, you know, loving on and discipling kids or students, and and you know, and and maybe that's something they should be doing. Maybe it's something else, you know, and which is fine. Um, but I, I think your guys' story is a huge testimony to uh, that it is possible and doable to continue to get after it, um, no matter what phase of life you're in. Um, 
and excuse me, um, how, um, for you, Des, how would you encourage, you know, moms or spouses, I guess, ladies who are maybe in a similar scenario? Because not every woman's going to handle these things the way you did. I mean, I, I, I mean, I think there's many women that it would just crumble, you know, for for whatever reason, and they're out, you know, I'm done, and uh, yeah, we're 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 bailing, and maybe there's some who would stick it out for a little bit, or or even some that maybe would stick it out for the long haul, you know, but there'd be tremendous bitterness and just um. So, I mean, what uh, encouragement would you give to uh? woman in your that's in your that may be in your shoes i guess so to speak uh well i guess um the first thing you know accept the fact that it's going to be hard you know and don't feel like you ha- you have to be um perfect every day <laughs> you know yeah. uh, you you know you're going to have you're going to have good days. You're going to have hard days. But uh, for me, again, it was just spending time in the Psalms. I just found myself there yeah. a lot. Um, if you have one good friend, I feel like I have a friend now in my life that if something like that happened, I could talk to her. Mm-hmm. Um, at the time, I didn't have anybody like that. Um, yeah. If you have a friend in your life, and that's one thing when we talked about relationships um, with the young, with the with the kids. I kind of was encouraging them to make sure that your relationships are God-centered relationships. Those should be the the most important relationships you have. And my dad always said, and this is, I really feel this is true. He always said, if you have one good friend, really one good friend in your life, consider yourself blessed. Mm -hmm. Because not all friends are going to stick with you through thick and thin. And you'll find out who your friends really are when the rubber meets the road. And that's how it was for me. Um, I had friends at church, um, but I didn't have a really good friend that I could just call. And I thought I did. I found out I didn't. Yeah. And that was tough. Um, so, if, but if you don't have anybody, God will get you through it. You just yeah. got to trust him and, and, and be obedient to his word. And for me, a lot of that was, you know, drop the bitterness. drop the anger get past that you you need to be like me you need to forgive you need to love you need to I don't care what he's doing I don't care what he said I don't care and not that I did everything right because I didn't and there were days I was not happy with him and he knew it and um but God kept bringing me back to what my responsibility was and he grew me a lot through that time and I you know it was hard and I would never want to go through something like that again I wouldn't want anybody I know to have to go through something like that. Yeah. But God did really amazing things through all of that and, and taught me a lot. And, um, you know, so I'm thankful for, for his grace again and mercy that brought, brought me through. Yeah. It makes me think that, I guess, in the context of marriage, if, if one spouse is sinning or being disobedient, that doesn't negate the fact that I can't ignore what Scripture still says. Mm-hmm. You, you know, I— I've never really yep. thought that, I guess, specifically before. And and maybe even Steve for you, I I assume communication's better. Oh yes. Um Good. I mean, he's still a very good he's a strong silent type. <laughs> I and love I, it. With long hair and a beard. <laughs> and I'm and I'm more of a talker. I, I am. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I nod a lot. Yep. Yep. Mm-hmm. No, that's not true. Yeah, you know, it's better. I mean, I have my days where, and I'm not really a morning person, and so I I have to, I mean, I am at work, and morning is my best time at work because I can really stay focused, but I'm not a talker to, to begin with, so for me to get up and visit, we have our mornings where we do, and I think we did this morning mm-hmm. a little bit, um, but that's not an everyday occurrence, and I think she's come to the realization that may not be ever, a, uh, you know, an everyday thing. Um, and, and we're okay. Um, I think, well, we're, you know, like a thousand times better than it was, Mm -hmm. you know, I mean, she's my best friend and, you know, you, you have a question here that says, what would you like to go back and change or do differently? And, um, you know, if I could have taken her hurt away, Mm -hmm. I would change that in a moment. 
that being said, I wouldn't change a thing. Yeah. You know, what's happened has made us. Um, and I'm not, I'm not saying that, that everybody needs to go through what we went through. Um, obviously, that's not a good thing to get your relationship where it needs to be. You need to get your relationship surrounded with God and God's word and allow him to take charge and allow him to be the center of your marriage, um, which we did not, which I did not. I was the leader, you know. Um, my wife, for the most part, always, um, she, she always let me be the leader. You know, she didn't take that away from me, even though I was a scoundrel, even though I was a dirty, rotten rat. Um, she never threatened that. She never took that from me. She always let me be a man and the man of the home. And I don't mean that in a bad way. I'm not a chauvinist. Um, but I believe the man has, you know, certain responsibilities. And um, even though, well, I can't say every day I did because there were a lot of days, you know, especially when I was drinking and on drugs, I, there was nothing there to give. But, um, but you know, even when I wasn't necessarily right to the world, right with God, um, I still held my family very high and they were very important to me. Um, and so I always wanted the best for them and I always make sure that they were protected and uh, that they had food to eat and clothes to wear. And uh, so that was always, and she was always very gracious in so many ways. But to change anything, you know, I am who I am today because of where I was. And, and it's not a, I'm not proud of it. You know, some of this stuff is really embarrassing and you don't even know the, all of it. Um, there's some stuff that just is between me and God and, uh, and, uh, Probably will never come to light again. Now, that being said, if you're struggling, you need to talk to somebody, man. Get my phone number. Give me a call. If you're dealing with, with what I went through, if you're dealing with, with uh, alcohol and drugs, you're dealing with theft, you're dealing with any of that, give me a call. Um, because it's good to have a brother. It's good to have someone that you can trust. And there's a lot of people out there that, you know, you think they're like this and you think you're your friend, but they're not. You know, the hard thing for me, I guess, through all of this is I expected the church to be there for me and to talk to me and to be a part of my life. I'm saying the church, not Bethel. Um, you know, um, the best friends I had were not believers. And that was hard for me to look back. And still my best friend outside of my wife, he's not a believer. And he, we've had many talks. He will probably never yield to the call. He probably will never become a believer. And that saddens me because he's a very good man. Yeah. Um, I trust with my life. I trust with my family. Um, but sad to say, you know, I didn't find that in the church. And I hope, I hope and pray that we're different. Yeah. Um, that we can be different um, as a church to be able to, to stand up for those who are hurting, you know. Uh, I was at a little seminar this, this, um, weekend on Saturday and, uh, somebody thought I needed some healing and she's probably right. I probably do, but <laughs> you know, um, those things that just probably no hope, <laughs> but no, I'm just kidding. But one of the things that I got from that was to be more compassion more compassionate, you know, when people are hurting and the, the topic was, uh, what, what is a trauma and what is just a bad day? And how we respond sometimes with people will allow them just to have a bad day and not trauma. And, you know, I'm more of the, hey, suck it up. You know, it's not that bad. You're not bleeding. You're not dead. Just come on, get on with life. And that's not true. That's not, that's not right. Um, we need to be more compassionate to people's feelings, even though I don't have those feelings. I'm not, you know, I'm not real soft in those areas. I need to be soft for other people and to be there for them because People deal with things differently. Some things are very, very hard um, for people. And she gave the uh, she gave the illustration of a, a five year old boy who lost his dad. Lost his dad. That would be a bad day. That would be a bad thing, and that actually would be trauma. But then another little boy lost his dog, and um, and that would be hard too. That would be trauma. Mm -hmm. And how do you handle that? Well, for me, I would say, yeah, we'll get another dog. It's not a big deal. But you know, that's not it. You know, there's attachments and, and obviously you're not going to get another dad. I mean, that is definitely trauma, but yeah. you can make it better for those individuals. Yeah, no, for sure. Well, I appreciate you guys sharing, you know, your story and, um, yeah, just very, very encouraged. I, and I, and I do pray that and, and hope that 
um, our church specifically, Bethel would, um, that we wouldn't be Pharisees who point at other people and say, I'm, I'm glad I'm not that person. And, I'm, well, I'm glad that I, you know, I've had this or that or that kind of stuff. I, I hope that our church would be a place that fight sin and not be okay with sin, but also be okay with helping followers of Jesus who are struggling with sin to deal with that alongside them. I think, unfortunately, um, <clears throat> that most of the people that would be willing to be compassionate and have a heart are people that have been through stuff. Yeah. Um, if you've never been through stuff in your life, if you've had an easy life, I think it would be really hard mm-hmm. to understand um, what somebody else, you would just say, why would they do that? Because I would never do that. And, you know, and that would yeah. have been my thinking, honestly. You know, what? What's? I can't believe. Why would they do that? You know, and then it, it happened to us, and you know, your whole perspective changes a lot, especially when you see how God works through all of that, and then uh, knowing and understanding the fact that there are other people out there that are struggling, that do have issues in their life that they're dealing with, and we don't know anything about it because they're keeping it to themselves. But yeah, yeah it, it, just the same thing with what he said, uh, man. If anybody wants to talk to me, I'm more than willing to sit down and talk with you. Yeah. Uh, too, so. Yeah. You know, one thing I'd like to just share for those who are listening, um, couples, be real. And I think that's one thing I have learned in my life, to be real. Don't hide in the sin. Don't be somebody you're not. Don't try and be self-righteous, mm. but be real and live Christ. You know, there's a movie we watch every Christmas, and it's called The Christmas Carol. And one of the older ones is or one of the better ones, but um, <clears throat> when... Uh, Ebenezer Scrooge is visited by the spirits of Christmas. He's visited by his old partner, Jacob Marley, first. And as he enters in, you hear this clanking and clamoring, and he's howling, and it's not a very pleasant sight. And he's hauling this chain. And uh, Ebenezer says, Jacob, what is? why are you hauling that chain? And he says, I forged this chain link by link in life. And it's long and it's hard and it's heavy, but yours is longer. And I think that's the way sin is for us. Mm-hmm. We forge it link by link and we carry it under bondage. And you can't ever be free if you don't confess it, repent, and get rid of it. Consequences, yes, but freedom far, far better than the bondage of sin. So, you know, be real and be real with each other. Um, be honest with each other. Um, they're, they're your helpmate. They're your soulmate. They're someone God has given you to be a part of your life. Let them be a part of your life. Yeah. No, absolutely. Well, how can how can those listening and how, how can we be specifically praying for you guys? Boy, I just say uh, just, just pray that God would use us where he has us as long as he wants us and that we would be obedient and... Um, be an encouragement to others and uh, just have great opportunities. I, I just, I'm just looking forward to great opportunities with my girls. I just, I love them. Uh, I've got the seventh graders and I just, I just love them. And I see potential there. I see how God can work in their lives. And I, I want them to not have to go through the stuff that I went through. Mm. I want them to be better. And that's what we've always talked to our own kids about too. You can be better. You've seen what, what has happened. You, you, you can do it better than we did, and we want you to do it better mm. and finish strong. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, that's great. And I guess that we just asked that we'd stay in God's will. Pray that we stay in God's will. And, and I'll tell this, you know, to, to tell this to many people. I've lived on both sides of the law. I've lived on both sides of God's grace. I've trampled God's grace. I don't want to ever be out of his will ever again, no matter what that looks like. I need to be in his will and what his desire is. And yeah. you can't go wrong. No, absolutely. Thank you, guys. I appreciate your time very, very much. Thanks for having us. Thanks for joining us for this episode of the House on Fire podcast. Our prayer is that this podcast activates your home for Jesus. May the light of Christ burn bright through you and yours.
Until next time.